Do you know what glass morphism is? <laughs> exactly. I just found out about it myself. It's a design trend. And I'm going to show you the slides and techniques I applied to achieve an animated glass morphic effect in PowerPoint. Behind the slide is not a tutorial series. I just take you through the editing view of slides and sequences that I've already created so that you can get some tips and insights from what I did and apply them to your own process. Hi people, I'm Chubi K. Roy Ago and you are absolutely welcome to another episode of Behind the Slide. Now, a couple of days ago, I was watching a 2021 web design trends video on a YouTube channel called Flux. I'll drop the link so you can check it out. Now, one of the trends that Rand Siegel talked about in that video was glass morphism. I've never heard the word before. I've heard of new morphism, did some digging on that when I first discovered it. When I then saw examples of glass morphism, it did look familiar. Like, I've always loved that feel, though I've never really done any design in that style. Now, typically you have semi-transparent, rounded rectangles having a frosted glass look that blurs the background behind the card. Now, the glassed objects are often enhanced by a drop shadow and a faint outline, like to kind of create a three-dimensional feel. So then I began wondering, can I achieve this design style in an interactive design environment, especially as somebody who doesn't write code? So I dived deeper into cyberspace looking for answers, but most of what I found were either about achieving glass morphism in like Photoshop or similar tools, or CSS tips, which of course means writing code, and that's, I don't do that. Now I use Wix to develop websites and I certainly didn't find anything online that helped me figure out how to do glass morphism within the Wix environment. So, so I decided, what the heck? I'm sure there's a way we can achieve this on a PowerPoint deck. Ah, that rhymes. So lo and behold, barely 10 minutes after hear, first hearing the word glass morphism, I jumped into PowerPoint to begin this quick experiment. Now, I'm a big advocate of functionality in design. In other words, why use a style if it doesn't add significantly to the user experience? Basically, if it doesn't make it easier for the person interacting with the content to get to the decision you desire from them, then why should you devote any time to creating it? I also believe that style helps us distinguish our brands. And there are definitely ways you can use this style to enhance the user experience on perhaps on an interactive in-store kiosk screen, for example. And if you're already using glass morphism on your other static communication, now you can apply it with animated content on your slide decks. You're welcome. So I'm making this video not primarily to demonstrate how to create glass morphism in PowerPoint, but to ultimately turn on that light of curiosity in people by giving you a peep into a process I devised on the spot for creating something I'd never attempted before. So let's look at it. All right, so we have our slides here. Um, as you can see, just like in the preview, there are four slides. You can remember there are four positions. Um, this is very simple. And I'm just gonna let you in on the elements that were used in achieving this. First of all, as you can see that there are four slides. If you have come across anything I've covered in any previous video about morph transitions, you will, um, you'll have an idea that that is what we use to achieve movement here. Um, so essentially, all the design work took place in only one slide. I did it all in the first slide and I simply duplicated it and then made this systematic movement of the object on each of those slides. So let me explain to you how we achieve that initial movement. Okay, now first of all, this is an image that I, I got off, it's a stock image. Um, and I chose this particular image because it is flat. There's no depth of field. So it'll give us the opportunity to have a distinct blur when we apply the blur. As you can see, the blur is pretty obvious. Um, it, it also has tiny objects, which is the, the, the grains of, is that wheat? Yeah, so those grains of wheat are tiny enough for us to be able to see 
how different they are for there to be a significant contrast between the blurred version and the sharp version and then the image is not so boring there's a calculator in there and some dollar bills yes okay so here here we go now this is a bowl of cereal just there to make the image a little bit busy uh, it's kind of like the fact that it's a you know it's a card so these guys the bowl of cereal the food economics text and this select button they're absolutely useless they're just here for decoration so let's go into uh, the actual design process now as you can see here i have uh, this rounded rectangle um, a powerpoint object and there's this blurred image within it now if i move this blurred image as i'll do right now you can see that the image in this uh, in the uh, rounded rectangle moves along with my cursor now let me undo that snap it back into position Okay, so how did I achieve having that blurred image inside the rounded rectangle? I go to picture format. Um, here it is, sorry, in, the, in, the, in this tabs group, the, the picture format tab, and I select crop. It probably won't be in exactly the same position in your own user interface, but when you select crop, it shows you what has been cropped off that image. Now, what I had done initially is to create a, um, a duplicate of the original uh, image, the, the, corn, the wheat and the calculator image. As you can see, when I move that image around, you can see it in the back. That's a duplicate of the original photograph. What I did was to apply a crop to shape. Let me go out of that crop again and show you what I did. Okay, let me, let me do this now. I duplicate this, I, I, I copy and I paste. So that's a duplicate, okay? Um, then I snap it to the exact same position, okay, as the, as the one in the background. I snap it to the exact same position, then I go to crop, and I select crop to shape. Then I picked a rounded rectangle, which is what, what that was. Um, I'm going to change that shape by going into the crop itself, okay? So I now actually modify the shape of the rounded rectangle manually. Um, and just, just shape it according to what I want it to be, which is what I did here. Um, I shape it and, um, that, and that's it basically. I'm going to get out of that crop now. So I, I go to the image, um, sorry, photo, photo, format picture. I keep calling it photo, I don't know why. Format picture and I go to the picture uh, attributes here. and. Picture corrections, okay? There's this element called sharpness. So I reduce the sharpness, which basically gives me a blur. And, and that's it. We have, we have a blur. So that image is blurred right now. Um, that, and that's the image that has been cropped. So um, what else I do to, to give it that distinct look now? Um, like I said earlier on, to make it look three-dimensional and distinct, we usually would give it an outline um, line. Yeah, there it is. Solid line, okay? But I actually made that line a little more transparent just, you know, because hey, it looks a little bit too, too harsh, okay? Aha, there it is. And then um, I go to, yeah, effects and I'm, I pick a shadow, um, select, I uh, usually like this one, and, and I make it, um, I give it some distance and a little more blur. So basically that's it. I reduce the transparency because it's not showing so much. Okay, cool. And that's it. And we've got our, um, our glass morph. Now, the thing is it moves, it moves with the, uh, the, the shape. So if we're going to do this, let me just delete this and we'll continue with the one we have. If we're going to achieve that movement, we're using a morph transition, okay? But the only way we can do that is by actually moving the object in the next slide. So what we do is, okay, let me, let me duplicate this slide. And I know this is just a behind the slides uh, session, but it's almost becoming a tutorial. When I move this to the desired position in this new slide, let, okay, okay let, me just, let me just move all of them. I move it to desired to the desired position, and of course the background has is offset now. But here's how we fix that: I go back into the crop, 
um, I go back into the crop by selecting crop and it shows me the whole image. Now here's the advantage of making sure it was aligned to the original image at the, in the first slide because all I have to do is just go back and make sure it snaps and it's aligned and automatically that's going to reflect the right way when I go out of the crop. Now look at it, see? So when I make that movement, when I, I, um, when I play the, uh, uh, the slideshow, you will see when I move to the next slide, it just acts as though it was a glass moving through that sequence. Whereas it's actually two different images, but what I've simply done is I've used the crop as some kind of mask like a window through which you see the image behind it, which is blurred and um, it overlaps the original image and just gives that illusion. Of course, we are in the business of illusions. So, hey, if you can make it work, why not use it? Okay, so magic. Let's look at it one more time. Let me delete this slide. That's just making things look funny. And we're back to the four slides we had before. Um, move the arrow, that's it. Move it again, that's it. Move it again, that's it. So hey, we've got we've got that little, uh, you know, and hey, you know, I kind of started enjoying using it as some kind of screensaver since I created it, and it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of fun. So that's it. I'm gonna challenge you. When next you see a particular piece of work that you like, regardless of what field or career you are in, Know that it is possible to pursue achieving it in your own capacity. If it's been done, then somehow you too can do it. Cultivate the habit of experimenting. Always dig deeper. Push the design boundaries you've perceived for years. The tools at your disposal are always capable of giving you much more than you know. You just need to be willing to explore. If you stay curious about creation itself, about the world you live in, the industry you operate in, the tools you have, the people whose work you admire, the people and things you interact with every day, or even your own capabilities. If you make that choice to stay curious, you will find life to be an adventure, keeping you fresh and alive with creative energy always. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel if you aren't already. And remember, if you're not able to create something, just create an atmosphere around you that makes creativity possible for others. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.